The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Images from the civil rights era are burned into our collective memories. What steps were taken to move the struggle forward? And what else needs to be done? Today we discuss the state of black America with Charles Ogletree, Harvard Law School professor and author of All Deliberate Speed, Reflections on the First Half Century of Brown versus the Board of Education. And now, Doug Besserov. Charles Ogletree. Welcome back to the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. Thank you. We're delighted to have you. Uh, well, in our last program, we talked about Brown v. Board of Education and what happened or what didn't happen in its wake. Uh, let's fast forward to the current situation and let's talk about um, where things seem to stand now. I've read um, African American leaders say uh, that they think um, that the community is running in place, not making additional progress. Is that your sense? Yeah, I think that's too simplistic uh, an analysis of the situation. We're making incredible progress in some respects. If you look broadly, just think of America in the 21st century. Who would have ever imagined, really imagined that in the year 2007, Ken Chenault, an African American, would be the president and CEO of American Express, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that we'd have uh, people like Stanley O'Neill, uh, the chairman uh, of uh, Merrill Lynch, that we'd have Dick Parsons of Time Warner AOL, uh, that, that we'd have Ann Fudge of uh, Young and Rubicom, and on and on and on and on. Remarkable progress in that sense. Uh, that we would have D Deval Patrick, governor of Massachusetts, African American, uh, members of Congress, unprecedented, uh, Barack Obama in the Senate. So that looks great. Uh, Oprah, uh, Michael Jackson, uh, you go down the list, the millionaires. Uh, you just saw Forrest Whitaker. Uh, and uh, uh, Ms. Hudson, Jennifer Hudson, received Oscars. So you look around and say, wow, incredible progress. But then you look at urban America. You look at Baltimore, at the crime uh, mm -hmm. problem that is still there, the schools. You look at Washington, D.C., the schools. You look at Detroit, Chicago. So there's an education problem. There's uh, a health problem in terms of young children of African-American descent. Uh, there's a housing problem. There's an employment problem. All those problems are crippling the African American community in the 21st century, even though we have more resources than we've ever had before. So we've made progress, but we forgot the least of these, those who should have been part of the process of bringing it over. Too many of us have made our own success and not been willing to lift a hand down to make others uh, capable of moving over that ladder as well. And that's our burden. That's our responsibility. Ours as in? All oh, Americans. Oh and that's one of the problems that people said, uh, Ogletree, what are you doing? I'm doing a lot with scholarships and tutoring and mentoring. But it's not a black problem. It's an American problem. And white citizens have to see as their responsibility the idea to make America better by trying to help the educational system, but by trying to get people. But look at some of these problems a little differently. I don't mean to say that. Well, you help me here. Protect mm -hmm. me. Um, but I think whites and I'm making gross generalizations here. I yeah. wonder where you're going, right. Doug. Let's okay. see. <laughs> we'll say something like, well, crime's a tremendous problem. Why doesn't the black community, why don't black leaders stand up and say, you know, we've got to do something to stamp out this crime and so forth. Um, and I think as a jumping off point, you know, move something a little safer, um, the black reaction to the O.J. Simpson case, I think, tells us something about the way many African Americans view law enforcement and policing, and that maybe that makes a, the fight against crime a little bit more complicated. Well, let me answer you in as direct a way I can. There is no black point of view right. on any topic. Uh, we're not monolithic, and I think that's the mistake. They believe this. And there's no white point of view. Uh, it, it's very dangerous because that makes it easier to sort of uh, group information and attitudes into a comfortable package, but it doesn't work. And let me. Talk about OJ first. Let's talk about OJ because that was a bit of a Rorschach test. No, wasn't but it? it's, it's it, only in the in the minds of white people 
who made it seem there's a black and white issue here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because uh, it was a horrific crime, an absolutely horrific crime. And with every case in American history, you prove that case in a courtroom before a jury and a judge with lawyers. Now, if you go back and look or ask anybody in the world to look at what happened, there was a lot of evidence we heard on television. Mm -hmm. But when you saw the case the government presented, the case they presented, I think it's fair to say, whether or not you believe O.J. Simpson is innocent, it's fair to say that the government left the case with not a reasonable doubt, but many reasonable doubts. And the jury had to say, am I certain to uh, the highest level that our criminal justice system requires? And I can see that jury saying, I'm not certain here. And, and there are black people, I, I know a lot of them, who are convinced that he's guilty. There are white people, I know a lot of them, who are convinced that the government didn't prove it. And when we take that, when we start to say groups are different, and, and the crime problem, I don't know a black community who isn't concerned about crime. If you a ask a police chief in Detroit, Chicago, Atlanta, New York, um, Baltimore, they arrest every day uh, the blacks and, 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 and try to deal with it. But I think that to try to separate it as if there is a black view and a white view on crime, it's not the case. And let me give you the, the, the last reason. Check the jails in Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Detroit, and Chicago, where you see substantial numbers of African-American jurors. Those jails are full of African Americans. So there is no, you get a pass because uh, you're black. There is a sense of responsibility that goes with it. So I think the problem is that we don't communicate, as I said before, to have the conversation across lines about crime, about education. African Americans want to study, but why should they be in a school with fewer resources, teachers that have all sorts of handicaps? Why should there be a difference with a, city, a school in Baltimore City uh, and one in College Park or other parts of Maryland. Why should there be a difference in education for children? African Americans are much more likely to be stopped on the street. We sometimes, well, when driving, we sometimes call it driving while black. Uh, African Americans are much more likely to have seen or experienced police brutality. Uh, as a former prosecutor, I can say uh, I'm used to cops lying. Mm -hmm. And the closer you are to the criminal justice system, the less you take what the police say at face value. And I think the poll data sort of reflect that right. as well. And so what I was just trying to say was part of the reaction to that case, uh, I thought, was a reaction or, or, or a response to the way the criminal justice system continues to treat African Americans. That's true, but you got to be careful how you phrase that because okay. it can be misinterpreted. Uh -huh. There is this was not a nullification verdict. That is, we're not going to let him off because he's black and victims are white. The, the opposite has occurred: that when there have been black defendants charged, uh, uh, black victims uh, of crimes by whites, there have been nullifications throughout our whole history of segregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these verdicts, uh, many of them in the South, it's clear that there were white defendants who should have been convicted and they were uh, absolved because of their race, even in the Emmett Till case in 1955. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the irony of that, the good thing, uh, sadly, is that after these white defendants were acquitted, they gave a lengthy interview to a reporter e explaining how they killed Emmett Till because they knew they couldn't be prosecuted again. And so that vindicated our sense that there, there were two systems of justice. But the racial profiling is real, and it is real that means that African Americans, uh, in many cases, are more sensitive to the idea uh, of whether or not there can be some uh, lack of integrity in the criminal justice system. Right. It's not like a chip on the shoulder, it's a difference. That is that uh, this is not a county where anything a police officer says, it must be the truth. He rescued my cat from the tree last year and, and he stopped me but didn't give me a ticket and he let my, home, my son come home after he was smoking marijuana at school in the suburbs and didn't uh, write him up. I mean, that deferential treatment means some people are uh, def uh, deferential and others, like the court says, you must be, you must scrutinize every citizen's testimony. A police officer, nor an expert, nor the accused, nor a witness have any less uh, validity in their testimony. It all should be subject to scrutiny. And that's the difference. We can't say blacks feel this way because they're anti-police. That's not the case. They're cautious uh, based on experiences, which means they're probably good jurors. On the other hand, many are struck, as I say in the book, from serving because 
uh, white prosecutors and black prosecutors assume they're going to be prejudiced uh, uh, and don't even give them a chance to serve. Now you, we, we, we've we been talking around uh, the O.J. Simpson case, and you mentioned Johnny Cochran. There are, in fact, a fair number of very successful black lawyers. Uh, one represented Monica Lewinsky's parents. Yes. Uh, Billy Martin, I think. Yes. Uh, Theodore Wells has represented Scooter Libby. Yep. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, it's just that we're finally getting our chance. Uh, the Monica Lewinsky's first lawyer was Frank Carter, an African American lawyer who was my boss at the public defender, and I represented him mm -hmm. because the government wanted him to testify against uh, his client and turn over his files. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, the, the, if, if you look in the uh, Washingtonian magazine, Michelle Roberts, a few years ago, an African American lawyer who worked with me as a public defender in Washington, D.C., was voted the number one lawyer in Washington. And that's high stepping and heavy cotton, right? Because it wasn't the best woman, the best black, the best lawyer. Mm -hmm. And you know, D.C. is full of lawyers uh, who are very confident that they are the best at everything. Uh, and so, so the idea is that if you look around, that makes a difference. If you look at the O.J. case, I thought it was important, not just Johnny Cochran, uh, but also the, the, the prosecutor in the case, uh, 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 Chris Darden, uh, who, who I've become friends with, uh, who grew up in, the, in Northern California, I grew up in Central Valley, California, uh, was a very successful prosecutor uh, in that case. If you look at uh, Zach Carter was the U.S. attorney uh, in uh, New York in the Eastern District and others around the country, there's just a long list of incredible lawyers and judges who are finally getting their chance, women and men. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting better all the time, but uh, we are standing on the shoulders of Thurgood Marshall and Oliver Hill and Constance Vicar Motley, and, and we're trying to keep the faith of what they created many years ago. And our viewers will see it. There's a picture in the middle of this book, the All Deliberate Speed book, of uh, the graduates of the Harvard Law School all together in one big picture. Yeah, beautiful picture of our reunion, and also a picture of the, those of us who worked on the Tulsa Race Rides case with Randall Robinson and Michelle Roberts, Dennis Sweet, a phenomenal lawyer down in Mississippi, who also was a public defender in D.C., Johnny Cochran, and many other great white lawyers. And, that, and so the idea is that there was, there is a talent pool that's rich, and America is stumbling on it, and I just uh, hope uh, that it gets better. My daughter, she'll hate that I mention this, who lives here in this mm -hmm. Prince George's County, uh, is a public defender in D.C., and the first second-generation lawyer to go to the public defender service. So you, you uh, said that's even better. You said stumble on this talent. Uh, let me use that as a reason to turn to affirmative action. Right. You've called yourself an affirmative action baby. Right. What does that mean? I call myself a brown baby, which means I was born uh, during the period of the brown. I was born in 1952. And I know that I'm from Merced. Uh, you wouldn't know where that was, but it's a very important small uh, community in the central, central California. Your viewers should know. It's important. That's where John Kennedy drove uh, by on a train in 1960. Uh, that's a very important point for us. That's the gateway to Yosemite. Uh, that's near the Gallo Wines. I mean, so all these great things. But other than that, you, you know, can take are, the boy out of Merced. You can't take Merced out. <laughs> that's exactly right. But I say that uh, because I ended up at Stanford in 1971 uh, because of what Thurgood Marshall and others had done in 1954. It's not that there weren't talented people of African descent in Merced, but Stanford couldn't find it. Right? They knew how to get to Los Angeles, even San Diego. Mm -hmm. But unless they were stopping for gas uh, or some of my mother's home cook cooking, uh, they would never even see Merced. So we were a generation who followed in the great footsteps of those. And think about it. Thurgood Marshall, Oliver Hill, Robert Carter, Constance Becker Motley, uh, all those great black lawyers couldn't have gone to Stanford or Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, but they went to Howard and Columbia and they used that to open up Stanford and Harvard and other places for people of my generation. So I am a brown baby in that I'm a beneficiary of what they were able to do. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, proud that not only that I went there, but there is no affirmative action. When I took that test at Ogletree, take the test. Uh, there was no separate room. There was no benefit. Uh, I was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate, uh, graduate with distinction. Got my master's degree there, went to Harvard Law School. All that's because I was given the opportunity. That's what affirmative action is. Uh, among those who have the necessary talent to give the opportunity to those who have been excluded in the past. Now, you will talk about your interactions or lack thereof with Clarence Thomas, but yes. Clarence Thomas and a number of other black conservatives are often accused of forgetting how they got where they are now. 
Is he the product of affirmative action? As much as you can try to uh, mince the words, of course he is. And that's a good thing uh, for two reasons. One, uh, if you think about going to places like Holy Cross, where he went to college, and Yale, where he went to law school, those places weren't uh, recruiting significant numbers of African Americans. And to try to deny it as if there is no consideration of race is to be naive. Uh, on the same token, uh, uh, one of my dear friends at Stanford, uh, a few years behind me, was Chris, uh, Steve Carter, mm -hmm. uh, who went to Stanford undergraduate and then went to Yale Law School. And he was question he, he wrote a book, uh, uh, Affirmative Action Baby, sort of, sort of skeptical of this whole issue. Uh, and yet he realizes that the, if we didn't consider race, we could have a, a class that's all white and all male, or in the 21st century, uh, overwhelmingly Asian. Uh, if you don't consider race at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. fact, what we see now is that white males are beginning to complain uh, because their numbers are dropping as the schools are looking around for more diverse talent, uh, women, uh, people of uh, uh, diverse uh, ethnic groups. And, and, and out of that comes a remarkable uh, set of, 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 of uh, talented individuals. If you think of uh, that, that worked Ted Wells, who you've already mentioned, but Loretta Argret was the first African American to be the head of the tax division. She served throughout the Clinton administration. Howard, undergraduate, Harvard uh, Law School. Ken Chenault, Harvard Law School. Uh, Dick Parsons, Harvard Business School. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Stanley O'Neill, Harvard Business School. Dick Parsons went to uh, Columbia and Yale, I think. But if you start looking at the talent pool, it's very rich in terms of what people have been able to do. And given the opportunity, it makes a, an enormous difference. But the, you have to not just go there. You have to go there and perform and make a difference. I, w I want to press that a little bit. I'd like to, for our viewers, I'd like you to explain why Colin Powell says he was a beneficiary of affirmative action. Oh, absolutely. Colin Powell is immigrant. His family is from Jamaica. Uh, and in order to get a start, it was important that he went to City University of New York. Uh, there was, that was the idea that he was accepted. He gave, and I hope people get a chance to see it, he gave a wonderful uh, address uh, uh, at, in, in Boston uh, on one of the anniversaries for the 54th Brigade. These are African Americans who fought with uh, the, the Commander Gould uh, during the war uh, and lost their lives. And he says, uh, I was the first African American uh, to be uh, the Secretary of State, but I wasn't the first qualified. He understood that he was lifted up among others because someone affirmatively gave him a boost. He understood that, he, uh, that there were many before him, uh, Chappie James, people like that who came through, Benjamin Davis, who were remarkably successful, but didn't get the same uh, sort of support. And I think when the president uh, signed a uh, brief in 2003 opposing affirmative action, Colin Powell stood up and says, I'm a beneficiary. He was part of that list of retired servicemen who said, because of race, we have transparency now. And I, I applaud him and Condoleezza Rice, who said the same thing. She was uh, the provost at Stanford when I was on the board of trustees. So we have all been lifted up in some respect. But, you know, there's also white affirmative action. And there are a whole lot of people who wouldn't be where they were if they didn't have a, a, a hand up, and sometimes two hands up, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to get to where they are. And I'm not going to start uh, looking at any particular offices being held in any particular place in the, in the country. <laughs> I think that would be uh, too obvious. Uh, but I think the reality is that, and I have nothing against that, people have relationships that give them opportunities, and they can make the best or worst of it. Uh, and that's what America is about. It's about affirmative action. And we call it, when race is involved, we call it a negative thing. But when it helps people to become a CEO or a president uh, or some other high-ranking official, we think it's all on merit. But if we look at the uh, track, uh, how they got there, it's clear that someone gave them that extra effort that made a difference. One of the things that makes affirmative action so controversial is that so many uh, young African Americans seem so ill-prepared for college. You talked before about public schools, and we talked before that about Brown v. Board of Education. And I know in your personal life, you're focusing on questions of education. Mm -hmm. um, besides suing the bastards, right, what do you think we should do to improve those schools? Well, two things. Well, first, we have to disaggregate. Uh, I have to pierce all your statements, Doug, okay. because there's not a relationship necessarily between the poor student who's in uh, third grade not making it, 
and someone who's applying to college. That's not always the same student. That student in third grade usually drops out of ninth grade. But if there were more well, of but, them, but, but you, know what I'm, but, you know what I'm trying but, to but, say. But, but I just want to make it clear for the listeners in the sense that the problem is that the educational system uh, is not working for many of our children. Yeah. They're urban and they're rural. There are a lot of white children who are having the same difficulties in rural schools uh, in parts of America that aren't getting educational opportunities because of the lack of resources. I don't mean just money. Uh, and the problem as well is that we don't recognize what, what my dear friend uh, Dr. Howard Gardner calls uh, the multiplicity of excellence, that students have different talents. They're not all just intellectual, but hands, thinking, et cetera, all those are part of it. And so we have to find ways to do that. But I'm working at the Charles Hammond Houston Institute on the achievement gap and on the school to prison pipeline and on reentry, how to make families better. My mission, my mission right now is to save black men. And if I save black men, it's going to save black families, it's going to save black communities, it's going to save America. When I make our community better, it's going to make America better. That's my number one goal. And, and let's talk about prisoner reentry for a minute. That's the yes. biggest challenge right now on the table. Hundreds of thousands of men in general, but right. black men coming out of prison either, with, well, certainly with a criminal record, right. so, which makes them less employable, maybe with less skills and so forth. What are you doing? Well, if we're, what we're doing, we're, I'm going state by state and literally city by city and talking to mayors and members of city councils and the clergy about how do we employ these men. We can't say that because you have a record, you are disenfranchised from being a citizen. What does that mean? It means that you can paint a building, you can cut grass, uh, you can drive a vehicle. Uh, you don't want them around children? Fine. You don't want them in schools? Fine. But I want men out of prison to become wage-earning, tax-paying citizens. Why? Because if they make their own money and they have to pay taxes and they receive a check, they will become invested in a family, in a community. Uh, and if not, we're going to pay it because if not, they'll go right back to the same behavior. They'll become a burden on society and we will pay. We will pay for 24-hour security, three meals a day, health care that's free. We will pay more than they would make. And so the idea is to get rid of the myth that you've been in jail, therefore you're forever in prison uh, and not being able to make uh, a difference. I say put them to work, make them earn wages, make them responsible, and make them realize that there is a benefit to citizenship that they have not seen and won't see when they're incarcerated. On that note, Charles Ogletree, thank you again. Thank you very much. A pleasure. And now it's time to turn to our audience for questions. Um, uh, if I could ask you to introduce yourself as well as ask a question. How you doing? I'm Noah Grabish, African American Studies Department. Now that uh, Virginia has, you know, apologized for slavery, do you think that the government will eventually apologize for it? It's a great question. I've got a number of responses. Virginia's uh, apology wasn't an apology, right? It was profound regrets, carefully uh, written. Why? Because they say Ogletree will read our words and he'll be here with the lawsuit before the sun goes down, right? <laughs> so they're very careful. Uh, but what's great is that Missouri is going to, to make it happen. And I think there's going to be reverberations around the country. At Brown University, African-American President Ruth Simmons had a commission write a report, and now they're giving scholarships and other things because of Brown's connections to slavery. Yale just decided to rename a building because of its connections to slavery. In Chicago, the city won't do business with any businesses unless they report their historical uh, connections with slavery. That's because of Alderman Dorothy Tillman, who passed that law several years ago. Uh, California has insurance law uh, dealing with slavery. So it's inevitable that our government will have to deal with it. And they have not dealt with it. Let's think about this. Uh, let, give me one example that happened nearly 20 years ago. In 1988, nothing remarkable happened. It was the last year of uh, Reagan's presidency. No big world wars, no colossal event, no catastrophic event. But two people, Robert Dole, the Republican senator from Kansas, and Daniel Inouye, the Democratic senator from Hawaii, both World War II veterans, got together and said, as members of the Senate, we have to look back on our time in war. And we as a country made a mistake. What did we do? We allowed our government to place in internment camps over 100,000 Japanese Americans. They weren't terrorists. 
They weren't combatants. They weren't doing anything to undermine our government, but we made a choice based on their skin color. So they passed the 1988 Civil Rights Law. They made it happen as law and gave reparations to all of those survivors from the uh, uh, internment camps from the Second World War. So government did something at that point. President Clinton in the 1990s called in the Tuskegee uh, men who were in the syphilis experiment and gave a public apology for that effort, which was important. President George Bush went to Africa and expressed profound regrets for slavery and what it meant. Just this year, Prime Minister Blair uh, said the same thing about Europe's connections with slavery. Uh, before he died, Pope John Paul II said it. So the, I have had a chance to see that the voices are beginning to mount, and I, the answer is that it will happen. And I see a, a much more progressive uh, generation of people in your lifetime who will see that if we're going to get beyond uh, where we are, we have to take a look back. They may say, no money, Ogletree, sorry. That's fine. But to say that we're making an idea that at least for our conscience, we're going to take a step away uh, from this. Charles Ogletree, thank you again for being with us. So, thank you for having me. Pleasure. <clears throat>